I am so excited to be here at Monkey Fest, and we bought those little Xamarin monkeys, and you can see them on both sides of the podium looking at you guys instead of you looking at us. And we will do a Q&A at the end of the session, and so if you have questions, hold them for now, and then when you, uh, at the end of the session, you can ask us questions, and you will get a monkey. We have a about 10 of those monkeys. Um, <laughs> And we, we thought, you know, it would, would be cool. Uh, we are developers at heart, so we want to kick off the keynote with a demo instead of slides, and then we do a seven-minute demo, and then Keys will take over and, and walk you through the slide deck. So let's do this. Um, the, the, the demo is called Five Minutes to Success, and uh, when we designed our current product, Mobile Center, this was really essential for us. We wanted to enable you guys to try our product and get to a success moment within five minutes. And so for that demo, I'm doing the same thing. Nothing is staged, that's a real demo, and I'm setting a timer that shows you that I'm not cheating any, at all. And within five minutes, I want to build my app for my Git repository into continuous integration and then deploy it on my phone and then actually able to try out the app on my phone. So let's see how that goes. Um, I need to, oops. Okay, so here's my demo setup, and the, One second, the let's check your mic. Oh, my mic is good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Sorry. Can everybody hear me in the back row? Yeah, great. Okay. So the the app I'm building is a a Swift app. It's a clone of a popular game called 2048. You can see it here on GitHub. It's open source on GitHub. Everybody, audience can try it out after the, after the keynote. And you can see, see here uh, see a this. screenshot of the game. We see this. Um, blank screen, great. <laughs> uh... <coughs> OK. Now we're good. Uh, so you can see here the screenshot. Um, uh, uh, of the game, and I, I take twos and, and combine them into fours, and then combine fours into eights, and so on. So I want to build this app uh, on Mobile Center. And what, what's worth noting is that this is not my project. I'm not the developer. I haven't cloned this onto my Mac. I'm really the PM here, and I want to show you how a PM can set up continuous integration without any kind of manual steps, without provisioning a Mac, without installing Node. It's really super simple. So let's, uh, let's get the timer running, and then I'll show you how that works. OK. So, so here's Virtual Studio Mobile Center. And you can see on the login screen that we did a lot of things differently compared to other Microsoft products. First of all, I can sign in with my GitHub account. And I love GitHub. I'm a developer. I'm on GitHub every day. So the sign-in process is really, really simple. And I don't need to provide my credit card data. I don't need to verify my phone number. And we can pull all the information, my name, my email address, my username from GitHub. And so I'm. I'm signed up within seconds, and now all I need to do is click on new, Add New App here. I add the title, 2048. I click on Add New App, and the app is created on Mobile Center. And I get quick and handy instructions on how to initialize our SDK, but for this demo, I'm ignoring this and go straight to the build um, service. The build service lets me set up continuous integration for my app, and I can pick between three repository types, Team Services, Bitbucket, and GitHub. And because I used GitHub, I can just click here, and it load, lo loads all my repositories through the GitHub API. I pick my 2048 repository, and again, because GitHub has APIs for everything, we are able to pull the list of branches of my repository straight from GitHub into Mobile Center, and you will see the commit messages and the authors of every single branch. So here are my branches, and some, some birdie told me I should try out this last branch. So I pick the branch, I click Configure Build, and you see something magic happening here. We analyze the repository and we figure out that this is an Xcode project, what the, my schema will be, the version of Xcode that I need. And so I don't need to copy and paste any past configuration. If you've ever done this in VSTS or Jenkins, it's super complicated, right? And all I need to do now is I, I enable the option here to sign my builds. I drag and drop my provisioning profile. I drag and drop my certificate. Oops, that didn't work. I drag and drop my certificate. And I enter my certificate password. And then the other thing, I want to distribute this build to myself. And this is an app that I just created, so I'm the only user for now. I click Save and Build. And now, behind the scenes, mobile, behind the scenes, mobile Center is doing all the plumbing. It's setting up a Mac um, with a VSTS build agent. It's provisioning um, uh, my GitHub repository and then building my app in Xcode. There is no need to do anything uh, otherwise. 
Everything that you see here is done automatically. I haven't, like, behind the scenes, you know, set up Node.js and installed something or went to Mac Stadium and got a Mac. All that is done for myself and uh, for Mobile Center. So you can see now how the, task, uh, the tasks are being downloaded. It's really we are using VSTS behind the scenes and we're provisioning all the build steps to build the app. Now, the build takes about a minute, and I have two minutes to go, so I can quickly show you some other options that you can see here in the build configuration. Most important is... I automatically increment my build number on every commit. And that's super handy. You don't have to go into the info plist and do some plist buddy magic or mod modify a manifest. We do this all for you. And so you get a new build number on every single, uh, on every single build to identify which build is unique. Okay? So I can just do this and save the configuration. And now I have them updated my build configuration. Again, super simple, super straightforward. Now you can see here still my, my build is still compiling. Uh, it takes about another 30 seconds, and I have one more minute and 40, 40, 40, 44 seconds to go, so I'm pretty confident we can do it. Once the build is finished, the build is uploaded into the distribu distribution service, which is basically Hockey App reinvented. So we're uploading the IPA file into distribution. I get an email saying a new build is available, and then I can install the app right away on my phone. <coughs> so the build is almost finished, and I can already switch here over to my phone. So this is here my real phone. Connected, connected to my Mac via USB. So no, again, no simulator, nothing. And in a, in a second, I hopefully get an email saying a new build is available. Okay, my build is successful. You can see the green check mark. I go into email and voila, here's my email. I click on the new build is available. And if you have used Hockey App before, it's exactly the same thing. I click on see, de see details. It opens the download page in the browser. Here's the download page loading. Here's my, my app, 2048. I tap on install. And a confirmation dialog shows up. And now my app is installing in the background. You can see that here. I'm waiting. Hopefully, the Wi-Fi is quick enough. I have 37, uh, 35 seconds to go. And here's my game. And I can tap on the game. And now I can spend the rest of the keynote playing the game. Thank you. Now, the, the, of, let me stop the timer because I think it annoys. <laughs> so the, the cool thing here is, of course, I could have you know, cloned the repository, opened Xcode, built the app, deployed it through USB on my device, and then had a, achieved the same result on the, um, on, on the device itself. But what I actually did is set up continuous integration. Now, whenever a developer in my team pushes a new commit into the repository, I automatically get a new build available to all my testers, and they can try it out. And I've set up real continuous integration in just five minutes. This is the power of the new Microsoft, and Keith will tell you a story of how we got there. Thank you, Thomas. Um, <coughs> well, uh, if you guys do need to have a conversation, we'll, we'll, we'll ask you to please do it outside. Thank you. <laughs> so there is a, a problem with app development that I think a lot of us saw, and, I, and Thomas is going to go a little bit later into some of the startups that had seen this problem. But I want to kind of explain the problem of app development that we are trying to solve, that we're trying to make better for people. And it really starts with, what is your day like? Well, as a programmer, what is in my typical day? I'm using, you know, I'm, I'm on the web. I'm probably reading a lot of Hacker News, right? A lot of Hacker News. <laughs> but what I really want to be doing is I want to be focusing on the important things to me. But what happens today? Well, I want to be spending some time, as you may have noticed, building my application, right? Today, or at least until Mobile Center existed, oftentimes an app developer, they needed to configure Android SDKs. They needed to configure Xcode. They had to figure out some way to make the build. All of these things just took so much time and they were very error prone. And after I got a build, after in some fashion I was able to say set up Jenkins or something like that, then I had to run tests and oftentimes I had to debug what was wrong with those tests or interpret log files to see what was going on. Now, very few people are going to believe that their unit tests by themselves are good enough. So oftentimes what would happen? Well, you'd want to spend time pulling out the device 
installing the app onto it, and then manually clicking around to make sure it was pretty good, right? That you hadn't broken anything. And that took time. And how did you get the app onto your phone? Well, that also could be very error prone. Uh, if you weren't using something like Hockey App or Test Flight, maybe you were plugging it into your device. But now what if you wanted to give it to somebody else? Are you taking their device and plugging it in? All of these things take up time for you as a developer during the day. Now, at some point, you want to hand it to a bunch of other testers to try it out. They're going to beta test it in some fashion. And again, that takes up your time. You have to go collect their device UDD IDs, right? You have to provision things for iOS. You have to make sure you know what the person's you know, uh, email address is. You have to find out what versions of apps they already had. That takes up a, a lot of your time. And you can see this is, is getting worse and worse for you, right? Now you're getting bugs from people, or they're having problems. Maybe the unit test wasn't right. Maybe the beta tester didn't receive your email. Oh, maybe it didn't install on their app correctly. Or, or hey, when they try it out, now they have a question for you. And so you're spending more time on these things, and you're triaging through these bugs. And then when you finally see, OK, there's an actual bug in my app, well, then you have to debug it. You have to like, plug it back in. You have to go through a stack trace. You, maybe you're hitting some breakpoints. You're trying to reproduce the issue for people, right? And this continues and goes on. And pretty soon, you're to a place where, if you remember you know, Windows 95, right? Your computers got really slow. And they got really slow because your, your hard drive was like your life. Your hard drive was full of all these little pieces of files everywhere. And at some point, Windows just wouldn't work anymore, and so then you had to defrag, right? Like, how many of you today feel like that is your life as a mobile app developer, right? Yeah, I'm like spending a lot of my time doing these things. All right, no one else is raising their hand. Is, is, you guys don't have this problem? If you don't have the problem, that's great. This has certainly been my entire life as a developer until very recently, right? That, that I get to this place where I want to spend all of my time doing the important things, right? I want to spend my time actually making my end users feel like uh, I'm providing value for them. I want, to, you know, I want to be coding cool new features on like cool new, uh, you know, cool new technology. I don't want to spend my time each day kind of going back and forth and back and forth between you know, finding out why I couldn't get some app on somebody's phone or debugging some other problem and collecting UDIDs. The, uh, the classic story I like to tell people is, I had a startup that was mobile first. It was uh, kind of like WhatsApp and things like that, but for video. And this was 2010 or so. And one of the, we, me and my co-founder, we released our app into the App Store. And I think we did Android first, in fact. And one of the first things that happened was, we would just do, we'd, you know, we'd publish a new release into Google Play. And then our customers or our users would, would come to us and say, it doesn't work on my device. And you know, they would mean some specific, you know, we'd ask them, OK, well, what, what device do you have? And they have some HTC version or some Samsung phone running something. And we didn't have those devices, for instance. So instead of spending each of our days actually coding new features, we were going to the mall, to the kiosks in the middle, right? finding the phone that the user had. And then my co-founder, he would distract the salespeople, right? Like, oh, I'm really interested in buying you know, whatever's expensive. And while he's doing that, I'm over here installing our app on the device, <laughs> reproducing the bug, right? That's just like, that's not a, that's fun the first time. You know, the first time you feel like Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible. <laughs> but by like the fifth time, <laughs> you're, you're, you're really annoyed that you're going to the mall instead of you know, coding new features, right? And then what's happening? Our, your, my competitors are getting way ahead of us, right? My competitors were selling their startups for you know, millions and billions of dollars, and I was at the mall. <laughs> and, and that doesn't work. So you, that's the world that, that we saw, right? You have this world of just going on and on, of getting interrupted with all of the things that don't quite matter as much. And so we really think that's a problem. What we want to get to a place is where you are coding awesome features all the time, right? And so I think this is a question for, for Thomas. And, and he'll give us, I think, a, a really great answer. But like, you know, 
how do we solve this problem, Thomas? Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we get to a place where code awesome features is taking up almost this entire screen? And you know, we don't only want to code awesome features. Ultimately, we want to deliver features to our customers. This is really what's important for us. And so we, we, we want to do a little time travel here and uh, talk about three startups that had the same mission uh, and that got acquired by Microsoft and ultimately brought us here. And that mission was make developers more productive. And that mission really was that developers are more productive to ship more value to their users and be more successful in the App Store to ultimately reach you know, five stars in the App Store or have the top number one spot in most um, grossing app. Right? And so the first startup I want to talk about is a company called Captain, or I think Captain in English. And uh, it was founded in 2008 in Paris, France. Uh, the guys from the team that's, that they're still working with us all have the same accent at Ben. <laughs> and uh, the other interesting thing here is 2008, that was the same year that Steve Jobs showed the iPhone SDK on stage for the first time. Right? A year after the iPhone was launched, we finally got the SDK for the iPhone. So those guys um, founded Captain and then in 2010 launched their product. And it was one of the first products that allowed app developers to collect analytics from their, from their apps. And so they had an SDK. I would install the SDK into the app. And then I'm able to send the analytics data back to their backend, go to the portal, and see what my users are using, doing with my app, custom events, crash reports, really everything I need to understand what's happening. And then they had the idea, let's use those analytics to create a segment of my users, an audience, and then I'm able to send a push notification to those audiences. If you remember in the early days when push notifications were launched by Apple and Google, you got a lot of them. A lot of developers started spamming me with push notifications, and Captain tried to solve this to segment the user base and only send specific push notifications to specific sets of my users. And one classic example is, um, because those guys are in France, is that they wanted to send a push notification when the new president got elected. But of course, only people in France really are interested what's the pre new president, right? The people in the UK don't really care about this. And so they got acquired in 2014 by Microsoft and then spent about a year to move Captain over to Azure. Um, you know how that is. It takes a while to move over to a new platform. And then in 2015, they announced their new product called Azure Mobile Engagement um, as a GA product with the same feature set as Captain before. So that's my first startup. And they made developers more productive, productive by allowing them to collect analytics and then push, send push notifications to user audiences. The second startup uh, called Hockey App is actually my own startup. And as you have probably noticed by now, I'm from Germany. I have a German accent. And uh, uh, I um, founded Hockey App together with three friends. And the story actually goes that in 2009, um, I went to my first ever Apple Developers Conference, WWDC. And at Munich Airport, I connect from my flight from Stuttgart over to San Francisco. And I was standing at the escalator. And you know, 2009, I still had the original iPhone. And right next to me stand a guy he, who also had an original iPhone. And you know how that goes. He had like a t-shirt with like a nice print on it. I had like a Star Trek t-shirt or something like that. We looked at each other. And he was going to WWDC, and I was going to WWDC. He was an iOS developer. I was an iOS developer. So we shook hands. And that's how I met Andreas, who then became one of the co-founders of Hockey App. Um, two years later. Um, and he brought a friend called Michael that he knew from a different company. And I brought a friend from university that I've been working with um, since 2009 on app, app projects. And we all shared the same vision. We were all developing apps for um, customers in Germany, for customers in the App Store, really for different, different app projects of different sizes. And we all had the same problem. It was a pain in the ass to deploy those apps to our, to our clients, to our customers, to our beta testers. You had to you know, do phone calls and explain to them, oh, we have to connect your iPhone uh, via USB to your Mac or PC. And it has to be the Mac or PC that has your iTunes media library on it. And otherwise, you lose all your songs. And you know nobody wanted this. And so when, when Apple introduced iOS 4 in 2010, we figured out that there's a new feature called over-the-air delivery or ad hoc distribution. And that's how Hockey App was born. And that's also where the name comes from, right? Ad hoc is key for your app, Hockey App. 
And so we, and you know, you know how naming goes. <laughs> it's, sometimes, uh, it's sometimes an awkward process, but it also enables you, you know, that's why the monkeys are here. Uh, it also enables you to create a brand around your name, right? So we had hockey app and we had puck and we had the rink and our company was called Bit Stadium, right? So you create like your own universe around the brand name that you once um, decided on. So in 2011, we launched our product and we made developers more productive by enabling them to send builds to clients within seconds and then collect crash reports from those clients and, and in a, at a later stage feedback. And those crash reports had the same pain point, right? You had to explain a user how they find the crash reports in the library folder that's hidden on macOS and then put it into an email and send it to you. And how often do you really do this, especially by, because in the meantime, our developers and myself, we had already created three new app versions, so we didn't even know whether that was a, a current bug or an old bug. And so crash reporting helped us with that because we got all of a sudden crash reports in real time, right? The user installed the app, and within seconds, I had a crash report that was fully symbolicated, showed me version, uh, uh, line numbers, method names, and class names, and I was able to reproduce the, the bug on my end and send them a new build, and then the SDK survived in the app through the test period all the way to the app store and so I got that full timeline of my crashes over the whole life cycle of my app. The other anecdote with hockey app is that uh, as early as late 2011, Microsoft started using us as a customer. So the Skype team had discovered hockey app, I don't know how, um, most likely through some developer event like here because that's really the best to find out about new products and get trust from other developers whether this is a good product or not. And so the Skype team started using us and so when Microsoft contacted us in 2014, we really had no idea. We just thought a new team tries to onboard to Hockey App and they wanted to get a demo and, and you know, find out what Hockey App is. And so between May and June or so, we basically were in conversations with Microsoft with no idea that they actually wanted to acquire us. And so it took a while uh, uh, and the, you know, you have negotiations and due diligence and all that stuff. And so we finally get, got acquired in December 2014, joining the Application Insights team. And our original mission at Microsoft was to add the hockey app feature set around crash reporting to Application Insights. And we did this in the, in the early 2015, in early 2015, all the way to build the build conference. But then we realized that hockey app was more than just crash reporting. It was really DevOps. And so in late 2015, Microsoft was one of the first companies who announced mobile DevOps. DevOps specifically for mobile developers. And we combined Visual Studio Team Services for the build process, Hockey App for distribution, crash reporting, feedback, and then application insights for all the analytics that you need uh, from your backend to your app um, to your JavaScript homepage. And so we announced uh, mobile DevOps in 2015. And um, then something else happened in early 2016, Xamarin, uh, the company got acquired. And so that changed everything again. Now, I'm sure a lot of people here in the audience know the story of Xamarin. It's Ned and Miguel uh, who, who founded Xamarin in 2011 after Miguel's team and uh, the Mono team got laid off by Novell, who originally had bought Xamarin uh, or the Mono technology from a company called Zimian that also Ned and Miguel had founded. So basically, they invented Mono in Zimian, sold it to Novell only to get laid off and get back their own IP to found the company Xamarin. And so in 2011, Almost at the same time when we founded Hockey App, Ned and Miguel founded Xamarin, and their mission originally was write native apps in C Sharp. And of course, that also makes developer more productive, right? Because I don't have to learn a new language. And in 2011, Objective C development really was horrible compared to what C Sharp had to offer in terms of frameworks, in terms of stability and crashes. But then, uh, as the Xamarin as a company added something else, they added also DevOps tooling. And in fact, the way they did this is by acquiring yet another startup called Less Painful. And Carl, the founder of Less Painful, um, will have a talk later today about Test Cloud. And if you think about that name, Less Painful, that's just the same thing as I'm saying about making developers more productive in a different way. It's like, you know, the Germans and Danish people, they're more negative, so they're thinking about less painful and not <laughs> more productive. <laughs> um, but really, the idea of Carl and his team was instead of, you know, testing in the Verizon store on a device, we put devices in a test cloud. 
and then let users run their automated test on those devices. And that's much less painful than just testing uh, manually whenever you have a new release. So, so um, Xamarin acquired less painful, made it Xamarin Test Cloud, and then they also, also launched uh, uh, their own analytics product called Xamarin Insights in 2014. And so in, in addition to writing apps in C Sharp, they also allowed testing on real devices and collecting crash reports and analytics, right? Making developers more productive. And then in March 2016, uh, uh, Xamarin got acquired. Uh, we went to build, uh, for the first time I met Keith, and we sat down at the Redmond office like a week later, and we looked at this. This was Microsoft DevOps landscape about a year and a half ago. Six different products with six different login systems, different feature sets, different billing models. Nothing of this story was really coherent to the developers. And you know, we got the feelings we're not making developers more productive. We confuse them with what Microsoft offers. And you know, it's. It's easy to say now that you know, we found a new mission for us, but you have to think this is not only about features and logins and brand names, it's also about teams, teams getting together, leaving behind their babies. You know, Hockey App is like my baby, right? I founded it, it uh, I sold it, it moved me from Germany all the way to Redmond, and now down here to Singapore to speak to you guys. But, but we did it. We, we, we looked at this and th thought, this is not right. We need to find something new. And we need to give you guys a story that's much better than just six products that Microsoft has acquired to make you, again, more productive. And this is uh, what we came up with and announced last year in November um, as a preview, Visual Studio Mobile Center. And people always ask, so mobile means only iOS and Android? No, mobile means every single client device, whether it's my Mac, whether it's my um, Windows PC, because those are all mobile devices. And there's really not a lot of difference between a Surface, an iPad, and an iPhone anymore, especially with new form factors coming out and the, the latest Samsung Galaxy Note is so big, it really is a tablet if you think about it. And so um, I'm giving back to Keith, and Keith will tell you um, what our thinking is behind Mobile Cent Center and how we brought our philosophy from the startups over to Microsoft to create a great product. Yeah, thank you. So again, this, this, there was this overriding goal, right, that Thomas kind of described to you. You know, I was the, the, the VP of product at Xamarin, and I worked a lot uh, with you know, Carl on, on Test Cloud and with the, the team building insights. And we cared tremendously about this idea of developer productivity and really making things better. And you know, like Thomas said, when we met, it was clear we had that same kind of desire, right? Our desire wasn't to just protect what we already had. Our desire was to make something even better that would really make developers more productive. And so we, when we thought about that, there was one thing that Nat, who's you know, our, our boss and he runs the division, one of the founders of Xamarin, felt was really important for us always to keep in mind. And that was that it was customers first, right? It wasn't, hey, we're going to use Node or Ruby or C Sharp or we want to use Kafka. It wasn't about what technology we were going to use to engineer uh, a solution. It was always about, let's start with what customers need. Let's start with what makes customers more productive. And let's start with what makes customers happy. And let's build that. And we've tried to keep that forefront in our mind at all times. And I would say if there's one thing I want you guys to feel free to always do, it's to email Thomas <laughs> if you feel like we haven't kept up with that, that promise. And I guess you know, if Thomas is oof, you can try me. Um, but no, we, we want to hear from you always. We always want to hear from you if you don't think we're keeping customers first. And what we think that means in the world of mobile development and in the world of mobile DevOps is that we let you focus on your app, focus on the features, focus on making your end users and customers happy and not focusing on DevOps. My hope is that there is a day where there isn't, I, I go and meet many customers. In fact, you know, me and Thomas have met a few different customers this week while we were in Singapore. And you know, there was one customer, they, have a, they brought up this very large team to kind of meet us and give us feedback. But there were people on their team whose whole job is mobile DevOps. That's what they do. They just kind of, they're there to make the rest of the developers um, happy and productive on their team. My hope is that if me and Thomas are successful, there won't be someone on your team whose only job is mobile DevOps. That the people on your team will be building features and that we've created something for you guys 
that we're your mobile DevOps you know, team member, right? And that Mobile Center is that for you. So we thought really hard, and because we had these experiences as startups, we felt there were some, some principles around how we should build Mobile Center that would help with this idea of putting customers first and really letting them focus on, on features. And so I wanted to kind of walk through these principles with you because I think it, it kind of illuminates for you how we think about this problem and how we think about what should happen. And the first is we wanted to have a Unix-like philosophy, right? If you've ever used Linux before, uh, the, you, know, you spend a lot of time in the command line and you spend a lot of time with tools that do one thing and one thing really well. And we felt that this was important to bring to this world. And so we started with that idea. We're going to have a lot of different features. We have features for crash reporting. We have features for testing. We have features for doing builds. We have features for sending push notifications. But you should not have to feel like you have to use all of those features at once on the same app. If you want to use Jenkins, you should feel free to use Jenkins and still distribute beta builds with, <coughs> with Mobile Center. That was important to us, that people, if you want to use everything together, it's even better, right? We, as I think there's the example you saw, um, there was a button to do, launch a test on Test Cloud from our build system. And we make that a single little click, and great, we'll, just, we'll do launch tests and show you videos, or show you a photo. And you know, Carl, in fact, in his talk, will, will go into even more detail on how you can run full test suites there. And that's a great, better together story. But if you want to use, like I said, Jenkins or something else, you can still do that. And we have a really great command line API and a really great public REST API that if you decide you're not going to use our build system, you can still use our testing system. And so that for us was very important, that from day one, a developer always has that choice and that flexibility. And we felt that was just something we were always going to deliver. So don't be fooled. Even though you see everything together, you, you pick and choose what you think is best. And we think it's all the best, and it'll all just get, get better. But we're not going to force that or, or constrain that on you. So the other thing I kind of mentioned earlier is we're actually API first. We have, I think, a very beautiful and usable user interface. The, the website is very nice to use. It's very fast and responsive. But everything you can do, so everything in that five minute demo that you saw Thomas show you, everything you're gonna see in the next demo that Thomas shows you, everything that Carl is going to show you in his talk, these are all things that you could do not from the website, you could do all of them from our REST API. It, it all works from there just as easily. And when we build the product, we build those APIs, we make sure they're public from day one. And we also make sure that for the majority of these tasks that the command line interface can do those as well. Again, it's important to give developers flexibility. That's one of the things we saw and we really want to make sure we do that. Now, uh, another thing that's very important to us and I think that distinguishes us from some of our competitors is that you own your data, right? We are collecting a lot of information about your apps and your users' usage of the apps. We are, you know, we're collecting test data, we're collecting end users and who's installing what and in what country they are in and what's cr the cr what crashes are happening and all those kinds of things. You can pull out that data, you can run your own reports, you can put it into your own system and we're not taking that data and then serving up ads from it. We're not trying to make being ads a better business through your use of Mobile Center. We're trying to make you more productive and we don't want you to have to worry about, oh, who has my data and are they going to use it to sell something or any of those things. That just doesn't exist. It's, it's your data. You can always pull it out with the API. We have even easier ways to pull out that data, but it's yours. And then finally, regardless of whether you're using the API or the command line or you're getting an email from us or you're going to our website, we want to make sure you always have like an exemplary experience. So we've gone out of our way to make sure that the API feels coherent. And if you want to use it, for instance, we have a swagger. And you can go to the swagger and you can try out anything you want. And it's nice and snappy, right? We've made sure that our SDKs are open source. So you can always see that what the code is in there and build it yourself and customize it yourself if you want. Same with the command line. And then obviously with our, uh, we have apps that we're building for beta testers so that beta testers can easily install things. And they're beautiful, they're responsive, they're easy to use. 
And of course, with the website, as you saw with Thomas's earlier demo, we've tried to make sure that it's just, it's just fun to use, right? And, that you, and again, we're kind of trying to meet you where we are. And I think the classic example of, of all of this is, you know, we, we let you log in with your GitHub identity. And that's, that's an unusual thing for a large company. Oftentimes, large companies kind of want to keep you all within the large company silo. And one of the things that we've brought as startups to Microsoft is this sense of, well, you know, you have to kind of be where the developer is. You have to go to them and meet them where they are. And every developer has a GitHub login. So we wanted to make sure you can use that GitHub login across these experiences. And that's very important to us. And so I think there's a, one other kind of principle, it's kind of a pillar of Mobile Center, and you can, you know, it's illustrated a little bit by this talk, and it's illustrated by the customer visits Thomas and I have made, but we want to make sure that we're always talking to you guys, and we're always hearing what you have to say. We're not just, you know, there's not just some email list that you sign up for and we blast you marketing messages. We want to have real, authentic conversations with you. And so, you know, again, you should always feel free to, to email us. You can email me, you can email Thomas. Um, but also, you can, on our website, we've tried to go out of our way to always make sure there's that little blue button there in the bottom right-hand corner. We think this is, is very important. And you see it again with a lot of startups, because startups know they have to make every user happy, right? And sometimes you forget that when you're at a large company. But we want to make every user happy. So what happens when you hit that thing? Well, you get a conversation <coughs> with us, and, and everybody on the team, it, it sees this. This is, uh, right now we use Intercom for this. But, and if you as a user, you're on any part of the website and you're like, hey, this isn't working. I don't understand something. I, I'm confused or I see a bug. Our developers and our product managers, we're all gonna see this. And then we can deal with it. We can have a conversation with you. And we have had thousands, I don't even know the number, thousands upon thousands of conversations with our customers through, uh, in this case, Intercom, where we are like literally hearing back your feedback. And you know, we're not perfect at it. Sometimes a conversation gets missed, and you know, when we see that happens, we feel bad about it, and we wanna do better. But our goal is always to kind of get back to you as quickly as, as we can, and hear more about what you're doing. Because we think that feedback loop is very, very important. I saw that at Xamarin. Thomas saw that at Hockey App. You know, Thomas has, I think at one point knew every customer and what they were doing and they all felt free to send him an email and say fix this and you know the great thing about uh, a hockey app for instance and I mean there's so many of these stories I've heard but you know somebody will email or slack Thomas hey there's this there's this problem and you know as a startup he just go fix it right he just go change it right then and then email them back or slack them back you know a half hour later and say hey I got it done is this does this fit what you need and we're trying to emulate that as much as possible. You know, as, as a big company, we can't be always as fast as a small startup, but we are desperately trying to get as close to that as possible, right? We want you to hit us up on this, this system and then you know, the next day tell you we fixed it, right? And every time that happens, is, it's just very important to us. And I think it, it kind of sets the tone for the level of friendliness and love we want developers to have for us. I think that's just so, so critical. And it's, can you go back just, yeah. Yeah. and it's important to point out, you see those three uh, names listed here on the, on the intercom uh, uh, window. Those are team members in our team. I want to like point that out. Sean is a guy in Redmond, Morgan is in Korea, and Daniel is uh, one of my original Hockey App team members. So you're actually speaking to the developers and the PMs of the team. And you know, we often get people saying, are you a bot? Right? And no, we are not bots. Sure, I mean, it appears a little bit like this because, you know, the avatar appears here and how does the web page know that Daniel is now available. But of course, you know, uh, modern technology like WebSockets makes this possible. And then they know that, uh, you know, when you're opening a support uh, ticket uh, at, at a current time, what is it now, 10, 26 here in Singapore. So the Redmond folks are probably taking off for the, for the evening. Germany is about to get up, but the team in Korea is almost in the same time zone. So they are there for you and they can help you and we are now an incredible international team and that makes it possible to have that direct interaction. But more importantly, you're not getting stuck with some Microsoft support guy that's sending you a thousand other questions before he actually lets you talk to an engineer. You can directly talk to our team. I think that's super important for yeah. us and we will keep it like this.
Yeah, it's very, very critical. Uh, I always answer yes to the uh, am I a bot. I think that's, you know, really yeah. sets the tone. Because the, uh, then they're very surprised. How good the bot yeah, technology the good is? Yeah, the bot is. I, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm powered by Azure. I'm a bot. You know, you should use Azure for your bots, too. We're all this good. It, it works great. Uh, and so well, that, that leads to the, the last point, which is, you know, we, we've tried to create these really great pillars. And we've tried to make sure that we have great customer connections. And then the last thing is, we do think that the, the value we bring to developers is not just making them more productive with DevOps, uh, but we also bring this value of, of helping you power your app with the cloud, right? Like Azure is, like, is very amazing. The, the, the actual the AI and the bot stuff in Azure is amazing. The, you know, the platform as a service uh, features are great. App services is great. And we want to make it easier and easier for you to kind of power your app. You have to have some kind of cloud back end for most apps. And we want to make that really, really easy for you. And so one of the things we've spent the last year on with Mobile Center is making sure that if you're using Hockey App and Test Cloud, you have that really great CI, CD, DevOps experience. But we've also been doing experiments with our customers and with teams in Azure to understand how we can bring you that same level of simplicity and productivity with that back end, with how, we, and how you power your app, right? And one of the things you guys saw you know, earlier this year, those of you who have used Mobile Center, we tried out things around identity and tables. And we got good feedback on those, but we realized we weren't going to quite get the, hit the bar that we wanted. And so we are going to, you know, we're revising how we do those things, but we added push notifications, right? And so now you can, if you remember the first startup that Thomas talked about was Captain. They let you, they took analytics in and then they let you send out push notifications to segments of your users who fit some criteria like, hey, I want you to send a push message to everybody in France, or I want you to send a push message to everybody, you know, using iOS 10 or whatever it is. And so we've added that functionality, which is not, it's not DevOps functionality, right? It's, it's cloud powering your app with Azure. And so we think that's very critical. And so there's a new feature that we want to show you guys. We're going to demo you today. It's another kind of way to kind of combine the best of Azure with Mobile Center. And Thomas is going to show you that. Yeah. My mouse is stuck. <laughs> okay. So I've already shown you this getting started page that makes it really easy to install our SDK into your app. And now for the second demo, I've picked a Xamarin app because you know we had Monkey Fest here uh, as a demo app. And it's an open, another open source project um, created by one of our solution specialists called Kobe. And the app is called Xweather. And the cool thing about this app, it's is that it's in the App Store. So you can actually go into the iOS App Store and download that app. It's a weather app. It uses data from Weather Underground. And you can uh, uh, see all the source code, how this is done, and how this app is built for iOS and Android in Xamarin, uh, showing you a re really you know, nice looking UI. And um, it's using Mobile Center. So Kobe built this app using Mobile Center Build, Mobile Center Test. He did his beta distribution with it. And then, of course, he's collecting analytics data. And to collect, uh, to integrate the SDK, what he did is that he went into, you know, the getting started page, and all he had to do is copy those three lines, uh, you know, to to pull in the right modules into the source code in C sharp, and then initialize the SDK with this one line. And you, all you need to do is copy and paste that, right? You don't have to find an app secret on some settings page. We all put that in here for for a seamless experience. Now I've done this, and I'm collecting data, and the data will appear here in the in the crashes service and in the service. And you can see um, your active users over time, daily sessions, session duration, and of course also what's, what are my top devices, right? And so the question came, so I have that, that data collection from the SDK into Mobile Center. How can I do more with this data? How can I bring this data into other Microsoft products like Application Insights? Because what we don't want is we don't want to create another silo that's just isolated and then ask you to add yet another SDK to get more data in Application Insights. So I can actually, you can actually see this here. I'm already connected to Application Insights. Oops. I'm sorry. I'm already connected to Application Insights, so I can directly click here on the View and Application Insights button. And what's now happening is that it's opening the Azure portal with my Application Insights resource. And um, I can see the exact same data that's streamed into Mobile Center now in Application Insights. 
And even more so, I get access to all the raw data that's sent from the mobile center SDK to mobile center. So here's my application insights experience. You can see I can see my users in sessions for the last 24 hours. I can see um, uh, uh, the device chart or the OS version chart here in a different, in a different way. And I can see um, in other, uh, other metrics. And I can actually go, go further down here and filter this in the same way that you filter your application insights data for your backend, for your Azure backend, or for, for your Azure app service. So you can go here and you can, for example, you know, filter by the location or by the pay to event. You have the full power of application insights available with the same SDK and with the same mobile center account. Now, the other thing you can do is um, you can leverage application insights analytics, um, which is a NoSQL database across all your raw data. So I can open this here. Um, it opens the analytics tab. Hold on for a second while we are loading your application. And this really is a database with tables in it, and those tables all hold my data, the data sent by my SDK, the data owned by you from your customers. So I can open a new tab here, and then I can just query. So I can just say, you know, give me all my custom events from, from the last, let's say, wait, go 30 days. From the last 30 days, and I can just click go, and now it's loading my raw data here. So it's, I have access to the raw data, and I'm not restricted in any way how I can process the data. Right? I can I can open this with a little with a little um, a carrot here and see all the all the information that's sent by OSDK. And then I can do things like um, summarizing this by the distinct count of the user ID, and then for example, group it by um, the client um, um, model to see how many users on, what, on which, uh, well, that's uh, Apple. Um, they're all on Apple. Uh, how many users, for example, are on which operating system version? So here, of my, of my limited user set, uh, 10 users are still on 10.3.3, and, and two have already upgraded to iOS 11. And then I can go further and you know, plot that as a chart, like a bar chart here, or I can also do, I think I want to donut chart here. So I get a nice donut chart of my data and I can segment it even more with that powerful query language to say all my users in Singapore or all users who have installed the app 30 days ago and so on. And then of course I can you know, take this now from application insights and export it into Excel you know, to give it to my business people or to put it onto Power BI and then pin that chart and hopefully you now iOS 11 takes off, takes off off and more and more people adopt iOS 11 and so my chart evolves in Power BI over time. So this is application insights, and to set this up, I, I can go back to mobile center. It's really easy. So I've already done it for my iOS app, so I'm doing it now for my Android app. And I can go here into the settings of the Android app. I go into export, and all I need to do is select new export, and I have two options. I can export into application insights, or I can export into blob storage. So let's do the application insights first. And I can just click Setup Standard Export here, and what it will do is it will use my Azure subscription to create a new application insights resource in Azure right here for Mobile Center. I don't have to go through the Ibiza portal. I don't have to click a lot of buttons. The same simplicity that we did with the build service, we also apply to other services in Mobile Center as well. The other cool thing that I can do is I can click on Customize here, and instead of creating a new application insights resource, I can link it to an existing resource. And what that allows me, and that's super cool for, um, for Xamarin developers, is I can stream the data from my Android, from my iOS, and from my Windows app into the same application insights resource, so I have all the data together from all my platforms, and then I can query over all those users at the same time. So to do this, I, I copy the instrumentation key here with a little copy button. I paste it here on the mobile center side. I click quick create custom in, uh, export. I have to confirm that this might cost some money. And now it's connecting my Android app into the same application insights resource as my iOS app. And now I have all my data together, seamlessly streamed. If I don't like it anymore, I can remove it at any time. I can move to a different application insights resource at any time. It's super powerful and super easy to set up. In the same way, I can do this for blob storage. And here I just do the standard export. And what that will do is it creates a storage account in my Azure subscription. And then all the JSON records that are streamed from our SDK to the portal are actually streamed into blob storage. So I really, really get my own data in my own blob storage. And then I can use stream analytics or a SQL database to analyze that further or to give export to the business people or to have it reviewed by the privacy people in my team. So this is, makes it really powerful. And we are breaking out of the silo of Mobile Center into a real connected Azure world where the one SDK that I put into my app enables me to do all kinds of things with, with Azure. With this, I'm giving back to Keith.
Yeah, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up with, I think, a kind of a final some set of thoughts. But first off, you know, we have what you saw here is, is a new item on our, our roadmap. And we have a bunch of other features. Uh, we don't have the time to go through all of them, of course, that we are doing that we'll think you'll find very useful. Like one of the most important, though, I think there's two things I wanted to mention. One is that we will be uh, generally available later this year. So we'll go out of preview later this year. And then I think you know, Xamarin developers are very used to Xamarin Insights, which let you send up handled exceptions that you've caught. And of course, we'll be adding that this year as well to Mobile Center so that you won't have to uh, continue using Xamarin Insights for that functionality. Uh, so let's just kind of wrap up real fast. Like what, is the, you know, what, what was Mobile Center, right? Well, Mobile Center, we want to be this mission control for your apps that makes you, the developer, more uh, productive every day because we've given you all the things you need you know, in five minutes, you got DevOps, right? Uh, trivially available uh, to add your RSDK, and you get crash reporting, you get analytics. And uh, with just one example, like, you know, we have push notifications and, of course, uh, our export into Application Insights and Azure Blob Storage to help you kind of power your app with the cloud. And I think the, there's a, a video here we'll play really fast uh, to kind of this tell you one story that one customer and how they feel about using these things are, and then we'll take uh, your questions. We love sports and we want to bring that excitement and energy to sports fans all across the world. Our fans are increasingly mobile, which is why an app in the fans pocket is crucial to success of Fox Sports. We cover over 200 events on any given day, covering over a million data points every day, nonstop. Thanks, soccer. That's huge. With 50 plus elites around the world updating simultaneously, the average NFL games might have 400 to 500 data changes, and we can send snapshots in time of the game as it progresses. Fox Sports is all about fans first. The Fox Sports app is totally personalized, and you can favorite your teams across all the different sports. And then the scoreboards and the news and the videos, all of your game alerts, they're all tailored to use. Their office has used Visual Studio and C Sharp for quite a few years now. And when we were looking at building a cross-platform solution for the Fox Sports app, we wanted to stick with the languages that we were experts in. So C Sharp and Xamarin allowed us to do that. We could add new features, test things, get them up into the Xamarin test files to see what they look like across all the devices. We're able to use Hockey App to locate crashes, fix it, and get an update out to them. Because we have to pull in thousands of feeds from dozens of different vendors, we needed a database solution that allowed us to marry all of that data in a nice, tight, integrated package. SQL Server for us has always been the foundation of SQL. The uptime on SQL Server has been almost 100%. We couldn't be happier with the feedback from the users. We've seen thousands of five-star reviews. We see the app growing <laughs> without any end in sight. The, the most important line in that video is when he says, Fox Sports is all about the fans, right? This is exactly what we have been saying here. It's all about delivering value to the customers. It's not about DevOps and cool technology and automation. It's about the customers first and shipping value to them. And the tools enable, enable Fox Sports to do this, not the other way around. Yep. And so just to kind of focus on this again, right? We want you to be spending your time making your users happy sending great features to them. And we really want to you know, be your partner in making that happen, right? We want to go, if you remember back to the beginning, I had this big defragged day where I'm trying to get features done, but I have all this other work. We really want to squeeze that in, right? Except, of course, you know, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on Hacker News, like some of you guys. So if you haven't used Mobile Center yet today, please sign up. We'd love to hear your, your feedback on it. We uh, are very proud of it. And I think you know, we've, everybody I've met here in Singapore who's a mobile developer just strikes me as the, the kind of people we want as customers and the kind of people we want as customers now giving us feedback. And so uh, with that, we will take your guys' questions. And uh, for the first, I think, nine or so people, if you raise your hand and ask a question, we'll Get give a you a monkey. <laughs> All right, there's a guy in back. So you say your question, and then we'll repeat it, and then with the answer. Uh, one, uh, so the question was, uh, hand to him, hand to him. 
The question was, uh, he's a Xamarin developer, and he's curious if we have any plans to support Tizen. Um, we actually do. Um, so you can um, just start pinging us. Um, we have a Tizen SDK built by Samsung. And I've actually been to the Tizen conference earlier this year. So there's some limited support for crashes and analytics in uh, Mobile Center for Tizen. And we, we, are, we are planning to extend that even more and to go like from mobile. The funny thing about Tizen is your, your TV and your fridge are really not mobile <laughs> in that way. But uh, it's still uh, .NET Core, it's Xamarin. And so it's super exciting uh, for us to, uh, to bring those features also into Mobile Center. Thank you. Next, this guy right here. Um, okay. Um, here, wait for the mic. I am uh, calling the developer, sorry. Uh, Xamarin has evolved so much over the years, as you've explained, uh, along with the services that Microsoft has acquired and which uh, supports developer productivity. This is great. This really gets me excited on C-Sharp and Xamarin development. On the other hand, this might be a controversial question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, I'd like to get your perspective on the future of Xamarin and mobile app development in general in the advent of progressive uh, web apps and browser capabilities getting advanced. Would you see mobile app, develop, uh, app adoption still rising, focus on a niche market, or perhaps Xamarin will have some kind of PWA support in the long run? Those, those are good features. The questions. Here's, here's your monkey. Oh, 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 oh sorry. <laughs> Uh, the question essentially, just to, re to recap, is you know, is, is mobile development? I'm just going to turn this off and talk real loud. Uh, is mobile development going uh, to be a little bit more of a niche thing, and will we see web apps resurge with things like progressive web apps, that kind of thing? Um, I mean, my personal opinion is, and in fact, me and Thomas were talking about this at dinner last night. Uh, there's uh, mobile app development is very popular now, but that doesn't mean it's going to decline. And I think in 2008 and 2009 and 2010 and 2011, people said the same things. They said, oh, what we really, we, web will take over. We don't need these native applications anymore. And I think just basically every year people say this, right? And I think what we've heard in the last year is, oh, conversational bots are going to be the new thing. And certainly those might be exciting new technologies that are kind of rising in popularity, but I don't think they're rising in popularity because of mobile developments decreasing, right? I think, I, I, frankly, I think we'll continue to see thousands and thousands of new apps every year all over the place. Yeah, I remember going to like, Google developer meetups in 2009, 2010, where the same question was asked. And most of the Google guys were saying, yeah, that web is taking over the world. If you look today, though, why right, Google did not only Android, they did Kotlin. And uh, Apple is doing all kinds of augmented reality stuff that you can't possibly do in the web today. And I don't, like personally, I don't believe that that is taking over. The native apps are taking over more and more of the space on mobile devices. And we saw it here with, with customer games in Singapore and all kinds of industries. Uh, and they're not, most of those customers are talking to us not about apps that go to the app store, they're talking about apps that go to the points. So we have, we, we reached, have reached what, what Nat, uh, our CEO, or CVP used to say, the amplification of the business. Every business today creates apps for their employees, uh, for, for stuff like free coffee in a factory building or for the automotive industry, and I'm not seeing how that will ever go away anymore. It, I would say it's taking over the world, and it will take over stuff like that you have a, a, a payroll application on your Windows PC that will be all on your phone going forward because really as an employee, you don't want to be locked down to your PC or Mac. What you really want is all your stuff on your iPhone and your phone. So I'm not, I'm not very old. I think what we see whenever we travel the world is a tremendous course of app development, including Xamarin. Yeah, I, I uh, noticed that Unity was on the list there, but is there any hope for actually uh, getting, uh, for instance, the Azure Xamarin Cloud connected with uh, ecosystems like Steam or PlayStation Network or anything like that? Hmm. So. Um, PlayStation Network is, I would say, not a question we have seen before. Like, uh, uh, you know, more, the more likely question in, in our um, segment is Xbox, and we are working with the Xbox folks to bring um, uh, mobile center services to Xbox developers. Um, Steam, we have a lot of Unity customers today on Hockey App, and they are deploying their apps to Steam. Um, we haven't really thought about um, pushing apps directly from mobile center into Steam, but it's certainly uh, an interesting idea that we will uh, consider for our backlog. Yeah. Um, I would say everything, 
everything that is um, um, game development is super interesting because of course it is again you know on your mobile phone first and then your your uh, immersive experience on your TV or in your in your living room is just an add-on really to to that device today. Uh, actually, uh, I'm from India, and uh, like uh, most of the startups going on there, the biggest challenge there is about cost. Uh, especially, I'm like uh, startups are not, uh, like afraid to join test cloud because of it's high costing. So, what are you thinking about the costing of mobile center? I'm like, how are you planning? Because uh, when it was launched in March, I'm like. I uh, saw the launch with uh, this Visual Studio 2017. So when I tried to join it, and uh, I saw a couple of costing, and I was kind of uh, scared. So is there any, uh, like, how you are planning to tackle that? Is the camera on? <laughs> let's, let's, turn the, let's, let's turn the camera off for a second. <laughs> no, I mean it. He's let's turn the camera off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, can, he can cut it. Yeah. So officially, we will announce pricing at, uh, at Cool. Hey, I'm working in very controlled environment right now in the company. So, <laughs> so a lot of things that we try to build, we are very limited because if it is in the cloud, like mobile center in the cloud, then we we want to bring a uh, cloud to the firm. Like we are thinking private cloud, but the all a lot of things that what we want is basically is not there. So. We wonder whether like the type of uh, hockey app or the things that will be available in the private cloud or can be containerized, and how that will be. I mean, we have to think that this is of the appointment because like we are sitting behind um, mobile parents. Everything that we have to release and publish to uh, another uh, set of the rules. Yeah, I mean, right now we don't have plans to create a, a version of mobile center that would work with. Uh, private clouds. It's something we've heard from a couple customers and we certainly are looking hard at can we integrate with say privately hosted you know Git repos and things like that but currently we aren't planning to make a version of mobile center that works in your private cloud. We think that would be very difficult to do. Yeah that said the, the ultimate answer today is TFS, Team Foundation Server that you can run on your own premise and you can and upload your builds from Team Foundation Server into a mobile center or hockey app to get distribution, to get question for the analytics. And then of course, through the export array, you can also export back into your own promise. So you would use Blob Storage as a middleman and then stream from there back into your own storage system. But the, the challenge with this going on premise is twofold. One is your employee devices usually are not always a corporate micro. You have employees traveling, you have employees that are not enrolled into, into my mobile environment, for example. So you have like a, a, a mixed setup and it becomes really complicated to offer a product that would solve all those problems on your on premise. The other problem is analytics and crash reporting in a scalable way for the point of order price is incredibly hard to do, right? If, if, if we on, on in our cloud mobile center see an increase in analytics, we just build boot another couple of Azure instances and we are good to go. But how do you do this in your own data center uh, uh, when, when, your, when your traffic explodes? That, that's really challenging problem from just a, a productizing perspective. Like it's not just something that you basically install on one server and you're good. You literally need your own cluster that's scalable and um, with your client solution. Yeah. Good morning. Um, I'm okay. So once you create a project in 
mobile center and you connect to your uh, Bitbucket or GitHub mm -hmm. account to it, is there any way we can disconnect it? Because twice we had a situation where we had to like delete the project. <laughs> but we didn't find no. an option to actually disconnect the account. So you, you can, I think you're meaning, can I deauthorize the OAuth connection? And we have like, if you look into our doc stack, there's like a help document that describes how to do this. It's a little bit complicated because the OAuth tokens on GitHub and VSTS only expire after like 24 to 48 hours. So you can go into VSTS and deauthorize mobile center and then after like a day or two, uh, the, the disconnect actually happens. And we're looking into solutions there. It's a little bit complicated. I, I hear your pain. And we have that too, right? Because for in May for Build, I was preparing a demo and accidentally on, on a, on a service book was connecting through the GitHub account of, a, of, a, of another demo person, and now all of a sudden I was connected to his GitHub account with his repos and not my repos, and I couldn't do my demos. I had to switch to a, like, I, I basically, in like five minutes, I switched to a different account, different setup to just be able to modern my So I, I feel your pain. We are onto it. Our team knows uh, that the problem exists, and we are certainly looking into solutions for this. Here you go. Um, Hi, good morning. Uh, I've been working this in a consultant company and saw a lot of consultant <laughs> company here in Singapore. Yes, I'm a C sharp guy. Uh, love summary, of course. But when we go to this industry, how do you position it to be a native? Because most of them, most of the consultant, I try to preach them. <laughs> Uh, doesn't work, and most of the developers prefer React Native. I even try to demo Xamarin, show everything Xamarin, do some stuff with Xamarin, but they still doing that, and they tend to show off. For example, like they can do export directly, Java directly in the editor, and then they can do something with, of course, Xamarin. Not yet, maybe. Uh, how how do we position that, and how? How to talk to them, for example. Oh, of course, uh, I like to share the technology of the, because this is a great technology, Zamari. Uh, but how to position them with them? Because if you try to them, uh, because of that, I tried first time, I said, really? And then when I tried, okay, I have to say amazing. <laughs> it, it is amazing. But I'm still stick with Zamari because, uh, yes, I'm a C sharp guy. I'm not a JavaScript guy. Yeah, it's a it's it's a good question. So like yeah, let, let's just, let's answer your question. Like, like oh, you gotta get him a monkey. Yeah, I mean, in the end, not everybody is going to use Swift. Not everybody is going to use React Native. Not everybody is going to use Xamarin. There is no one size fits all technology for developing apps. Right? It's it's it would be foolhardy for us to believe that the entire world is going to switch to writing their apps in any one language. Right? And so there are going to be developers who prefer React Native for any variety of reasons. Generally speaking, I think one of the, the most popular reasons is they're already experts in JavaScript, and they really want to use JavaScript. And that's, that's fine. I mean, our team actually owns the React Native extensions in VS Code um, for Microsoft. And you know, we have services in Mobile Center for React Native developers. You can do crash reporting with React Native. You can do builds with React Native. Uh, we have Code Push, which lets you do live updating for React Native. That's, that's fine. There's going to be teams who are going to just want to use React Native. And, that's, and they're just like there's going to be a lot of teams who want, want to use Xamarin, right? There's pros and cons to each technology. There's no one size fits all, right? If you're a JavaScript team or live updating you know, CSS assets is really, really important to you, React Native might be a better choice for you. It's, but you, it has its own cons, right? It's not really backed by any company in terms of production quality. You know, Facebook supports it you know, in an open source like fashion. So if, if quality is important to you, that might not be, always be the best choice. right? Uh, if in terms of performance, you know, running inside of V8 is going to be slower. And so you know, obviously, Xamarin doesn't have those issues. A Xamarin app compiles down to native code, and you can do all those things in a native fashion. It's going to be much faster. You know, you're going to get the support of Microsoft when you build a Xamarin application because you're a, a Visual Studio customer or a Visual Studio for Mac customer. And obviously, C Sharp is a highly productive developer language compared to JavaScript. So there's just, it, and from our perspective, 
You know, we want people to use the tool that's going to make them happiest and most productive. And with Mobile Center, we'll make sure they support them. And there's just a lot of good reasons to use all of these technologies. And, you know, we're open to all of them, right? All right, I think we're out of time, right? We've got time for two more questions. Yeah, right. two more monkeys. Yeah, perfect. So, uh, there we go. Uh, you can, how about you talk to them afterwards? We're, we're running way over time. Uh, hi, my name is Quang from uh, Nexo. So uh, my question is, uh, what is the advantage of uh, Mobile Center compared with uh, Firebase? Mm -hmm. Good question. You want to take it? Sure. So the, uh, what's, the question was, what's the advantage of Mobile Center to Firebase? I would say Firebase is, you know, it is a powerful service. It is the most directly competitive service that Google has to Mobile Center. They're, they're, they're very much, you could use, you could mix and match between them if you want to. The advantage with Mobile Center, we've taken a very agnostic view of each operating system. Firebase is a little bit more friendly to Android developers. We're, we don't care whether it's Android or iOS. We try to treat both uh, the same. With Mobile Center, because we have CI, uh, we have build, and Firebase doesn't have a build system of any sort. You have to use somebody else's build system. So from that perspective, if you really care about DevOps, generally speaking, Mobile Center is going to have more DevOps technologies for you. Test Cloud in Mobile Center is much more powerful than the testing solutions in Firebase, for instance. Our, the distribution features, the way you send things to, you publish to stores or to beta testers is much more powerful. Firebase does have their real-time database and Firebase authentication, and Mobile Center doesn't have either one of those features today. So those are going to be more powerful for those guys. So it really just depends, right? Yeah. Thank cool. you. The other yeah. obvious question, the other obvious answer is that um, Mobile Center supports my platforms. So we have Windows support, uh, we have Windows uh, uh, coming for test out too, and uh, we have Mac OS support, and then we have SDKs like that, and uh, that Firebase will directly offer themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hello. Wait, oh, there you are. Hey. Yeah. In response to your, yeah, yeah. In response to your offer, uh, beyond the, the four principles, do you have the possibility of co or joint data management between the user and also the provider? And the question is that, do you provide a kind of a guidepost? Because the legal landmine seems to be obvious. So do you have those guidance or guidelines, you know, in place that you know we can, uh, you know, uh, evaluate the possibility? Right. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so we don't provide legal advice to people on how to handle customer data. We're not your lawyer, and uh, we're not going to become your lawyer, unfortunately. <laughs> so we try to be very flexible. You, we have our open API that lets you manage all of that data, and you know, obviously, we want to make sure that it's easy for you to comply with. Uh, local regulations whenever we can, but uh, so we want to help you make sure that things are deletable and all that kind of stuff. But we're not we're not going to ask offer guidelines in the end because there's just too many different uh, territories and municipalities with different laws, and we can't possibly build a product that will automatically take into account all of those things. And so we just have to be flexible and hopefully let you do the right thing. And so yeah, at least we can have some guidelines. Sure. We're Let's. Yeah, we, we can't offer, we just can't offer guidelines. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, thank you, though, for the question. All right, that was it. Thank you guys very, very much. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much for Tom uh, and Keith for this awesome presentation. Uh, I couldn't think of a better way just to kick off uh, MonkeyFest. Uh, but a couple of uh, things to mention.